but the Chinese are doing bad things in this world. And we have to look at them in that point of view. And you remember the University of Michigan during apartheid in South Africa, we divested ourselves of stock. But now we have the administration at the University of Michigan embracing people who are obviously as bad as the people in, that we accused of being bad in South Africa. So we're not dealing with nice guys, okay? We're dealing with people that we have to be very, very careful with. I would argue that we're already in an economic war with China. Uh, and as an example, I would uh, use the embargo of rare earth metals. Mm -hmm. So rare earth metals are, a, um, are, are very important components of uh, modern electronics, mar modern car technology, green technologies, et cetera. And uh, almost all of those uh, metals are either mined in China or, they are, or they're controlled under contract to China. So the China has been using that as an economic tool. And uh, there was a recent example where there's a dispute in the South China Sea about the ownership of certain islands. And there was a fishing vessel where the captain and the crew were captured and imprisoned by the, uh, uh, by the Japanese. And they were going to put the Japanese captain on trial until China embargoed Japan uh, for the receipt of all uh, rare earth metals. And, and Japan had to cave in and send the, the, the ship captain back to China, give up their claims, their territorial claims and that sort of thing uh, uh, that he had violated in order to get them to start shipping the rare earth metals again. And shortly after that, when uh, Obama put in a complaint to the World Trade Organization that they were over-subsidizing their green technologies, then they also included the United States in that embargo. Well, I'm hearing uh, um, that uh, what's going on uh, worldwide, uh, the, the Kyoto Summit, they're, they're pushing down the, uh, and placing a lot of restrictions on what, uh, what America is supposed to be able to do because we've had this, you know, a long history of, of polluting the air and, and things like this. And so we're, we're tighten down, tightening down those restrictions while we're opening the door for China to rape and plunder. <laughs> Basically, uh, and you know, and they've they've sent all these people out to all areas of the world to establish these these corporate uh, agreements and and to to basically control tr uh, a lot of these different trades and um, you know. So uh, while while we're being restricted in the things that we we do in our manufacturing, they're opening the door. Uh, to to having more opportunities, to to creating more jobs and uh, things like this. So um, we will be getting more into this uh, very shortly, and uh, want to thank you for joining us. And we'll be back in a minute. The Center for Judicial Accountability is on a mission to improve the quality of our judiciary. This is an organization dedicated to removing political consideration from the judicial selection process and ensuring that corrupt judges are properly disciplined and removed. Why shouldn't judges like everyone else be responsible for their incompetence and deliberate misdeeds? Why should judges be allowed to run their courtrooms as their own private fiefdom, free to abuse litigants and lawyers who come before them? We are building a national organization focused on the problem of bad judges, judges who are incompetent, abusive, and dishonest. By dishonesty, we mean judges who knowingly disregard clear and controlling law and who write decisions which fabricate or deliberately omit critical facts. These judges destroy people's lives, families, and businesses, and for ulterior reasons, torpedo important cases affecting the public. The financial cost of appealing a judge's bad decision puts appeal out of reach for the average citizen. Yet those who make the financial sacrifice and do appeal often meet with the same realities on the appellate court level as in the lower court. Even where appellate courts reverse a lower court's blatantly erroneous decision, there is no personal cost to the judge for his judicial malpractice, but only to the litigants who have been wronged and to the system. Incompetent, abusive, and corrupt judges create havoc at the trial level and overwhelm the system with otherwise needless appeals. This puts the courts in crisis and is extremely costly to taxpayers. Obviously, improving the way we choose judges is critical, 
whether by election or appointment. There must be safeguards to ensure that only persons of the highest competence, integrity, and judicial temperament become our judges. The Center for Judicial Accountability is one of those ways. Grand juries may be another. Hi, I'm David Scheid, and on my program, Power Corrupts Again, I am both pleased and honored to have as my guest Drs. Bill Kaufman and Doug Smith. We are going well beyond speculating about how China has been getting our money and our manufacturing jobs to be getting their hands on important national security secrets of institutional researchers here in the United States. With institutions such as the University of Michigan pretty much handing them the plans as well as the keys to their newest nuclear war missiles. Now we must keep in mind that the People's Republic of China arose from a civil war in 1948, followed by suffering of the nation's people through two more similar events, the Great Leap Forward occurring between 1958 and 1961, and the Cultural Revolution spanning three more years between 1965 and 1968. These internal struggles left China with a third world economic and military situation. So in order to correct their national deficiencies and to achieve the great and powerful status otherwise deserved of such a large population, technology and know-how had to be acquired by any means necessary and by all means possible. What better way could be found than to send Chinese nationals out into the world, a massive diaspora or movement of the Chinese people to conduct business with other countries of the world. And while relying upon American universities like U of M to educate these foreign nationals and so-called humanitarian subject matters. It reasons then that financially, American universities should only be too happy to grant admission to these Chinese spies, I mean students for humanitarian reasons. Business owners strive to hire the best, and many believe that the brightest of these newly educated Chinese could be motivated to remain in the United States to thus contribute to our own national well-being. On the surface, it makes sense for China and the United States. However, what university administrators and staffers have instead instituted has been the greatest transfer of technology and know-how ever in the history of civilization. What an excellent example of the law of unintended consequences at work. Here's the scoop. Information technology has now revolutionized the transfer of information as well as it, its accessibility, both authorized and unauthorized. Government officials in both China and America are keenly aware of it too. The lifeblood of America's economic and military security is being drained away, yet judging by the activities of the American industrial elite partnering with government and the academic elite, it is clear that frequently the work of these three entities serve only to exacerbate the hemorrhages of our American intelligence. The People's Republic of China has been able to accomplish what the Soviet Union was never able to do during the Cold War by stealing the technology and know-how components from America's brightest minds. I might add that in many cases they don't even have to steal it. They just schmooze the information out of greedy Americans, many of whom are otherwise playing the field as corporate CEOs and university board executives. Am I right here, Dr. Kaufman and Dr. Smith? Well, at the University of Michigan, they have stolen a lot of good military technology that, that hurts us. Because now, you know, we have these super weapons 
the Chinese also have these super weapons now. And now we're going to have to build the next generation. And now is it back to the Cold War where everybody's stealing and, you know, you have to build new weapon systems because the other guy has gotten it? And perhaps that's true. It was noted in the New York Times recently by the Secretary of, of Defense that perhaps there will be another arms race. And with our company, com country almost impoverished right now, you can hear the discussion from Washington, where are we going to get the money to do it? Let's just go down the list of technologies that they've stolen, okay, from the University of Michigan. Okay, we get rocket and launch vehicle technology. Um, 1948, a graduate of the U of M became number two in their ballistic missile program in China, okay? Nuclear weapons and thermonuclear weapons technology. 1965, a physics major graduated from the University of Michigan. She went back and built the equivalent of Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Reentry vehicle technology, that went on very recently. We had a student working under Professor Boyd with regard to the development of nose cones, these, these things we have here. These are the things that protect the warhead during its reentry. And the, the better you can make the nose cone, the, the bigger the warhead uh, that, that you have uh, inside to do, to do damage to us. Uh, also recently, we had a, a, a lady with clear connections to the People's Liberation Army who studied satellite technology. And about 18 months after she went back, studying the latest computer programs, et cetera, we have for orbits and trajectories, the Chinese sat, shot down one of their old weather satellites and put trash all over the orbits up there for us to run into. And then recently, last year, they launched a hunter-killer satellite, which allows it to go next to our satellites, sniff them mm. out, decide what it is, and if it's a threat, okay. Take it out. Take it out, okay. And then we also have the, the University of Michigan professor who went to China for a month and lectured on cruise technology, cruise missile technologies. Cruise missiles are very important in modern warfare. And the Chinese have developed a, 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 a very good cruise missile. It's now a threat to our ships in the, in the Western Pacific. And the thing that really got me to start writing memos at the University of Michigan and eventually take early retirement was their attempted theft of Trident missile technology. Uh, we're very dependent upon the Trident submarine concept for our strategic well-being. And we had a delegation of Chinese who arrived, six of them, from Harbin Tech. And we had our Chinese department chair, Professor Xi. Mm -hmm. And these folks came in and simply sat down and said, how do you make a Trident missile? What's the thickness of the casing? What's the heat transfer to the throat area? Et cetera, et cetera, details which are likely classified, and they should not know. But Harbin is well known as the MIT of, of the Chinese military. They even have a solid propellant rocket factory at their university. So this was really the thing that got me upset and got me in trouble. Um, you know, my office was subsequently moved into the equivalent of a broom closet uh, because I did this. And all my books were mixed up and models were damaged, et cetera, as retribution for speaking out. Um, <clears throat> now, right they wanted you to, uh, to reveal at, at this, uh, this meeting here, they wanted you to reveal some of this technology, and, and uh, you said no? Correct. And, 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 you know, and they were in for the long haul. And one of the results to my complaints to the authorities, my department chair, the dean, et cetera, was, well, how, how would you like to go to China and we'll double your salary, we'll give you a driver, we'll give you a walled compound, we'll give you a cook, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and we can make your life very comfortable over there. They offer you enticement and first. That's right, and, and based upon my Cold War training, uh, I not only said no, but I said, heck no, okay, I, I refuse to do this. Well, then my, my life was made miserable at, at the university. Uh, right now, okay, uh, through the efforts of our politicians, uh, there, there are two grants at the University of Michigan uh, jointly with the Chinese. One has to do with electric vehicles and the other one has to do with green energy. And we're going to work jointly with the Chinese to develop cutting edge technology, which what will the Chinese do? You know the answer. They're going to steal it. Mm. Okay? So why are we sharing this stuff, okay, which is our future, with the Chinese? Um, the Chinese also stole few air explosives, which was my thesis topic because when these people came over in the early 80s, we talked about coal mine explosions and other things, and it's the same technology, you just apply it differently. Um, also, 
one of these individuals went back to China where he's become the expert.